Adriana Valeski here with Joel Alconin. We have Nate Tobik on the line. He's an investor and the founder of CompleteBankData.com. He also runs OddballStocks.com. How are you doing this morning, Nate? Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. I'm doing very well. Thank you. It's a great time for you to be on. we got lots of action going on in the financial sector. The first thing I want to talk about is this report from the New York Times that Goldman Sachs, I mean, 150 years of being a large and powerful Wall Street bank, is now going to be starting a consumer lending unit, um, you know, going to offer loans for a few thousand dollars to ordinary Americans and compete with Main Street banks and other lenders. What's your take on this news? Yeah, so th this is interesting. You know, they clearly are jumping on the bandwagon. I have to say, my mailbox has been stuffed full with offers from these consumer lending really? groups saying, you know, we want to offer you twenty-five thousand, fifty thousand. Just you know, mail this letter back at. Usually, they're about twenty-five to to thirty percent uh, interest rates. So it's like, I think Goldman wants in on this business. Uh, it it's interesting. So. Right now, they do all of their lending. They have about $42 billion in, in loans outstanding. They do all of that to their wealthy clients. So these are clients who already have business with them. They might be lending against a securities portfolio. They know this type of client well. Like high net what, worth? Very high net worth. What they do not know well is the average consumer, the the type of person who's going to be responding to a mailer saying, yeah, you know what? I have no other choices. I need $10,000 now. I'm just going to mail this back. I'll take the interest rate. So I think Goldman, there's two ways to make money on these, these loans. The first is to hold the loan to make the 25% interest pay out 4 or 5% uh, in, in, fee, you know, in interest cost and operating expenses to, to hold the loan and make the spread. I think what Goldman's going to do is, is approach this a little differently. I think what they want to do is mimic the uh, lending club, which is LC a little bit, in that lending club originates loans, essentially packages them and resells them to retail investors. And my guess is that Goldman is going to take these consumer loans, repackage them, and then sell them to institutional investors. And then they make money on the backside servicing the loan, originating the loan with they they make fee, there's fees on the loans. And so I, I think there's this allure that with a great IT team, they could somehow put a website out there, get this thing up and running, and there's almost no cost to it. Uh, but right before this, I was looking at the Lending Club's financials, and they're not making any money with this model. So if this is somehow this this perfect model that they're they're going to try and and mimic, I don't really see how it works out. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm not sure exactly what their plan is, and this seems like a completely different um, audience and market that they're going after. So interesting move that they're going for. Um, something else that you had mentioned to me before the show is you wanted to talk about tightening regulations on account fee income. Uh, give us a little bit of your take on that. Right, so the uh, this CF, uh, the, the CFPB, it's the Consumer Finance Protection Board, they're really coming down hard on banks and fee income. So there, there have been some reports recently saying that they've been asking banks for, for some very detailed pieces of data from their internal processing systems. And one thing the CFPB is looking at is overdraft fees and overdraft charges. So what they want to crack down is, crack down in, on is the situation where, say someone has three transactions and they they will arrange them so that the, the, uh, the smallest transaction goes through first and then the largest transaction generates an overdraft and they get fee income from that, the banks do, versus maybe the point in time when someone actually paid for an item. And so what this does is this maximizes the overdraft overdraft income. And, and so the, the regulators want to crack down and say, we want, they want to stop the reordering. That's, I think that's the lowest level of um, what we might see in terms of, of reform, all the way up to limiting the, uh, just the service income and overdraft income altogether. And so th this could hurt a, a number of banks. There's a lot of banks that, that really survive on uh, 
the overdraft income. So I we pulled up some data and just kind of offhand, Regents Financial, 12% of their revenue came from service fees. Now, not all of this is overdraft, but you know, that's they they really like the service fees. And if you go a little further down, Fifth Third Bank has about eight and a half percent of their revenues coming from from service fees. And a lot a lot of these big banks are in the the seven to to eight percent range, and so if if those are really limited, there could be an immediate impact to uh, to these banks' revenue. Now that's not all bad news. And so a couple years ago, we had a situation where the Fed said we're going to limit the credit card processing fees. And if you remember, Mastercard and Visa and Discover were all hit really hard because investors thought. This is the end of these companies. There's no way they're going to be able to make money after this. The, the interchange fee, it was chopped by 80% or so. It was a lot. Well, if you look at the stock charts of, say, a Visa or MasterCard, they clearly were not hurt. They've been able to earn. The earnings have, have just continued to grow. They found a way to work in, inside this environment. And I think banks are going to do the same. But that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be some short-term pain when these regulations finally go into effect. So the banks are going to find a way to make money, but when there's this squeeze, where they make money is going to be redirected. So, you know, what what could we see on the other side of that? Maybe if rates go up, we might see deposit rates move even slower than expected, or there might be a little bit added to uh, to, to mortgage rates. Yeah, I don't I don't really know what they're thinking in terms of of where they'd make this up, but I think it would be foolish to say that the the government's going to cut the overdraft fees and that's just it. They'll never be able to make that money back. They're going to make it back somewhere else. We're on the line with Nate Tobek. He's an investor and founder of CompleteBankData.com. Also, uh, as a value investor, runs a stock called OddballStocks.com. So you mentioned some stocks are going to be hit by that potentially uh, get a little haircut from this. Uh, what are some of the stocks that you think uh, are bank stocks that uh, may be susceptible uh, if this actually goes is implemented? Right. So, so some of the the biggest. The banks that are going to be hit the biggest is IBOC is one, or WABC, West America Bank Corps. Regions Financial, they're the third highest in our list of um, service income to to revenue. And you know, the, so the caveat is these aren't all overdraft fees, but but I pulled out servicing fees uh, because I don't think that the government stops at overdraft fees. This the whole service charges is a giant bullseye, and it, it would be crazy to me to say we just care about overdraft fees, but we don't care about these other egregious fees that you're also charging. So, if a bank switches from charging overdraft fees to, um, you know, charging a low balance fee, what's really the difference there? It's it's still that same fee income that I think is going to be hit. Okay. And uh, I mean, is it something that, uh, you know, people should look to exit these stocks or is it just, uh, you know, a little blip on the radar? What's, uh, you know, what's your take? I don't think it, I don't think it's necessarily a little blip. I think, I think it's something that an investor doesn't need to exit today, but they need to keep this at the back of their mind. They need to, to put this into their model and see that this sort of an effect could be coming. And I think it speaks to what we might be seeing in terms of regulations going forward. So some of the articles coming out on this really have been talking about the uh, the impact of the smaller banks. And a lot of smaller banks could, could be hit a lot harder because they really rely on these fees even more. And so it's, it's un, unknown whether or not the regulations are only going to penalize bigger banks or if they're going to be all banks universally. It, I don't know, but it, it's it's worth looking at this and maybe avoiding a bank that so say say you're an investor and you you own a couple banks. I would maybe look at these if there's any of them close to fair value and it looks like they're going to have an outsized impact from these new regulations. That might be time to exit, or it, it might be worth adding a little bit of a discount into the model. Okay, boy, these financials have had a nice run here with the anticipation of a uh, higher interest rates coming. Uh, can this move continue in the financials? I I think so. I. What I'm looking forward to is when rates finally rise, I think we're going to see uh, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand that's going to buy into these. I think we're going to see a couple day lift off. And 
is I don't know if that's sustainable, but for for a relatively short term trade, I think once rates rise, there's going to be there's going to be a little bit of a lift off in the financials. Everyone's expecting a higher rate to do miracles for these these banks. It will eventually, but it isn't a, a night and day type thing. But I think in the market, we're going to definitely see see a boost. OK, and uh, I know you don't focus as much on the uh, on the big banks here, but uh, could you just, uh, you know, give us a couple stocks or a couple bank stocks that are on your radar that maybe ones that uh, haven't lifted off yet? Yeah. So one one that's interesting, it's actually up where you guys are is Flagstar Bank Corps. That's FBC. And it's a, a large Michigan bank. They have had problem after problem that they've been working through. So they've had lawsuits. They've had loan losses. They're trading at 92% of book value. And they, they've they essentially replaced their whole management team. And they're now on this track to, to get things fixed. So what you have is almost a, a clean start for the bank. And they've really been paying off all of these outsize issues. So they had uh, some losses in 2014. They're earning money again. And I think that a bank like this, if if the environment stays as it is, we don't have a recession. There's a lot of tailwinds with rates coming, with rates that are going to rise. Uh, a bank like Flagstar could could definitely benefit. And uh, you know, there, there's a lot of banks like this. Uh, there's some some smaller ones I know. I like to follow uh, banks that have activist investors at times. So um, two that are really interesting are Polonia Bancor and West. West End Indiana Bank Corps, both are very, very small banks. But what's interesting is, even though these have small market caps, you have a lot of these activist investor funds still interested. So um, in terms of West End Indiana, let me pull them up here. I see w that they had a, uh, a big beat there at 30 cents, but I don't really think they compared. Maybe they had um, some additional income, but that uh, whatever it was, it, it, it induced that gap and go up to the $16 area, and then it's uh, been to the races here. I, I don't know. I'm showing this chart. I don't know if they did a, uh, a reverse split or something, but showing a high back at 220. I don't know if that uh, is relevant on the monthly chart. Uh, any other banks in this region that uh, are catching your fancy? Uh, you know, so, yeah, there, there's a, in, in terms of Indiana, I would say um, I, I've seen some, some information that says that Indiana is overbanked and it's likely there's going to be some mergers in Indiana. Uh, I had mentioned last time I was on some of the Puerto Rican banks. I still think the Puerto Rican banks are, are worth a look. There's the, the question with the Puerto Rican banks isn't necessarily the, the Puerto Rican consumer the, whether the mortgages are going to be good or bad, it's actually the the assets these banks hold in government entities. So, uh, a bank down there might own, say, bonds from a sewer department. And so, what you need to ask is, will that the sewer department, the sewer and water, will they actually pay on these these assets, and are they good, or are they going to be written down? And so that that could be a, a pretty good trade as well. You know, I, I think a lot of a lot of the financials are really the sentiment is really hinging on on where rates are going to go. We've we've seen who can operate in the low rate environment. And so I would say at this point in 2015, if there's a bank that is still losing money and it has the same management team, it's worth it's worth passing on them because they haven't figured out how to adapt. If you have a bank that had significant losses, they've changed their tune where they have a new management team, they figured out how to make money. That's a bank that's worth looking at. So the, the, all the larger banks obviously have found a way to work in this environment. Regional banks are, are doing well with that. And the smaller banks, it's really luck of the draw. So some, some of the bankers have, have figured this out. Other ones are just complaining because they haven't. And they're hoping that, that something happens at the government level. I think what we're seeing at the, at the regulatory level, though, is it's not going to be helping small banks. It's actually hurting them, things like the overdraft fees. And now you have the competition potentially from, from say, a Goldman in the consumer loans. So uh, whereas a small bank might be, be offering these, these consumer loans to, um, to smaller uh, borrowers, now you've got Goldman blasting out mailers trying to attract the same customer. And so that, 
that's not going to be great for a, for a small bank. Uh, but the, the guys who figured out how to work in this environment, I think, are going to do well. And they're not relying on that, that sort of income. Uh, Spice in the chat's asking about the P.E. on Flagstar Bank, and uh, she's having it at 85 for a bank stock. That's a pretty high P.E. Is that a, is that a correct uh, number? Yeah, that's a correct print. So, the, you know, like I said, they had, if you look at um, their past year, it is just, it's been a, a disaster, I guess you could say. They had a, a giant loan loss provision, and they've... Um, They've really been paying off these fines. There was also um, there's a, an outstanding litigation uh, that they had to pay. So yeah, th- it's this is really more of a turnaround than a, a cheap quality bank. So um, in terms of quality that's cheaper, you're going to really have to go down the market cap size and look at things maybe um, 100 million or less when you get to. So I think Flagstar has about a billion. Their market cap's about a billion dollars. And when you're in that range, the the banks that are that are selling at lower multiples are are more distressed turnaround situations rather than just neglected banks. And so I I prefer neglected banks. And uh, but I think there's a lot of you know you buy a turnaround and there could be a huge snapback if earnings come in higher than expected in a quarter. And these things are are going to move a lot quicker than just a neglected bank that's sitting there waiting to be bought out or uh, just kind of slowly going up about a you know quarter of a percent every couple of days. I want to get your final thought here on um, interest rates. We do have the Fed meeting today. Uh, we've heard for quite some time rates were going up. Now we hear chances today september december when do you think rates are going up and uh you know how many how many rate hikes do you first see for the fed so i i think we'll probably i don't think we're going to see anything today september december is somewhat likely you know i a year ago it was the same story so a year ago everyone was saying september december here we go rates are going to be rising well it's a year later and nothing's changed Although the one thing that has changed is the economy is in a better position today. So there's maybe a likelihood that they'll increase. When they do increase, it's going to be small. I would say 25 basis points at the most. And I think the the Fed's going to be slow to, to raise them after that. So it isn't going to be a situation where they go up 25 basis points in September and then another 25 in December. And they, they keep increasing like that. I think it's something where we see a, a one-time 25-point jump, and then uh, it stays flat for a while as, as the Fed reassesses and, and sees how the market took it, where things are going, and then maybe another baby step after that. I think this is going to be very long, very drawn out. There's a quote uh, by Bernanke, who's, and he said that he doesn't expect rates to normalize in his lifetime. Uh, that's to me, that's that's very significant. So I don't know what he expects his lifetime to be, uh, but this this is a very long term thing. We've been on the line with Nate Tobik. He's an investor and founder of CompleteBankData.com. He's a value investor and also runs OddballStocks.com. Nate, great to have you on. Always great input for our listeners, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Nate. Thank you for having me on.